what you're looking at are the remains of the oldest freestanding stone building in the world, a temple built over a thousand years before the Egyptian pyramids and Stonehenge in England, on a small island in the Mediterranean, the island of Gozo, where man first set foot some 7,000 years ago. Gozo is also known as the island of Calypso, the nymph who lived in a cave, and according to Homer, convinced Ulysses to stay with her for seven years before he went home to Greece and his ever-faithful wife, Penelope. It's amazing what you find in the caves in Gozo. Long before sailors arrived and settled here, the Maltese islands were on the superhighway between Africa and the North Pole. In the caves and grottoes, because the islands are as riddled with holes as Swiss cheese, we found incredible fossils and skeletons, a topsy-turvy world of dwarf elephants and giant dormice. And often, we found these caves because someone or someone's wife or even someone's dog has fallen down a hole. That's what happened here in Shara in 1923 with Sherry's Grotto. Naturally enough, underneath Sherry's house. And back in 1888, when Ninu fell into his stalactite-encrusted cave. Just a few minutes walk away from Ninu's cave and Sherry's grotto, are the megalithic temples we saw at the start of our visit. Two separate clover-shaped temple systems, attached but not interconnected, standing over eight meters, that's over 26 feet in height. And they built them over five and a half thousand years ago, and put a roof on. According to myth, a female giant carried the rocks on her head. After a walking tour in the sun, Indian figs make a welcome and tasty surprise. Food. And the thirst for knowledge. Gozo's museums are particularly rich. The island has been visited and conquered many times by peoples who are on their way to something bigger, though Gazetans would disagree that that place could be any better. Phoenicians, Greeks, Carthaginians. And Romans for more than a thousand years. The Normans, pirates, the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, Rhodes and Malta, the French, and finally the British, who left their influence in the most unlikely places. You get a better English breakfast here than in England and the famous red telephone boxes and blue lamps outside police stations are now just memories in the UK. But the Gazetans have also proudly preserved their own heritage, the things they've invented and developed themselves. While all around the Mediterranean, nations and religions were slaughtering each other. Even after the Knights of St. John had been given their new base in Malta in 1530, with the job of protecting Christendom from the threat of the Turks, they did nothing to protect their outpost in Gozo. The population's only hope was to seek sanctuary in Gran Castello, the old citadel built by the Arabs. In 1551, the entire population of the capital, Rabat, was kidnapped by Sinan Pasha and Dragut Rice and sold into slavery. According to the terms of the capitulation, the Turks should have left 40 Gazadan leaders behind. Instead, they left the 40 oldest, most handicapped men they could find. There is said to be a colony of the descendants of some of those kidnapped in Tarhuna in Libya, 
Others were sold in the marketplace in Constantinople. Yet still the country folk stayed, and others moved across from the mainland of Malta. Audesh, as the Gossetans call our island, exerts an attraction as powerful as Calypso's siren song, a suitable home for peace-loving artisans, farmers, and fishermen. And finally, the knights decided to fortify the Gran Castello, or Citadel. And started to build their famous towers around the coast. Not to protect the population, but to protect the General's Rock, or Fungus Rock, as it's called today. The rock is covered with what was called fungus melitensis, a sort of natural antibiotic used as a cure for hemorrhages, dysentery and ulcers, apoplexy, venereal diseases, uh, used as a contraceptive, and more recently as toothpaste, and for dyeing textiles. The Arabs called it the treasure of drugs, and the Knights of Malta were determined to protect this treasure. The penalty for trespass or theft was termination with extreme prejudice. Gazetan sailmakers were rapidly developing new skills, and that's why the knights finally found it worthwhile to protect the population. They also took advantage of other Gazetan arts and crafts that did well in the medieval export market. But for centuries, the population of Audish, or Gozo, has been decimated many times. By the plague as recently as 1813 to 1815, by cholera in 1837, and for the last hundred years by emigration. Leaving their women folk behind waiting to be sent for, the men went to look for work. In 1901, 65,000 Maltese, more than a third of the population, lived in other countries around the Mediterranean basin, and they were already moving further afield. After the Second World War, more than 14% of the population left between 1946 and 1953, with the bizarre result that there are 360,000 inhabitants in the islands, 23,000 of them on Gozo, but there are over 600,000 Maltese in North America and over three quarters of a million in Australia. That's why you find kangaroos and Canadian maple leaves and God bless America on plaques all over Malta and especially in Audesh, because Gazetans come back to their roots. They come back because they're rich. They come back because they're poor. They come to make a pilgrimage. The Basilica of Tapino is the most famous place of pilgrimage for Maltese and Gazetans, and for many, many of those who've emigrated over the years. The church was built with their donations. On the 22nd of June, 1883, a peasant woman, Carmela Grima, was praying in the 16th century chapel that stood on this spot. She heard the voice of the Virgin Mary, and in the following years, many miracles were attributed to the holy place. The local population started building this new church in 1920, but it was finally consecrated over 10 years later. Long, hard work, but a labor of love that integrated the original chapel with its original paintings and votive tablets. Pope Pius XI gave this magnificent Romanesque-style church the status of a basilica in 1932. And Tarpino was the point of Pope John Paul II's silent communion when he first visited the Maltese Islands. Tarpino is impressive and very special. But it's over in Chauquilla, where you'll find the fourth largest church rotunda in Europe. The third largest is just a few miles away in Masta, on the mainland of Malta and the Rogazitans who've never made that half-hour trip to the mainland. The Citadel had a questionable place in the heart of John Parisot de la Vallette, the Grand Master who defended the islands during the Great Siege of 1565. He was imprisoned by the order in the Grand Castello for four months. Before being banished to Tripoli for two years, he was being punished for aggressive behavior. The capital was renamed Victoria, in honor of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. Duera has so much to offer. Fungus rock and its companion, the crocodile rock, 
we could enjoy a simple but unbelievably tasty fish and oyster lunch served with crusty bread in front of one of the fishermen's bars before taking a dip in the protected waters of the inland sea or swim through the tunnel into the open sea or maybe we'd go by boat and come back into the bay through Itiepa, the azure window, although it looks more like a door. After a leisurely glass or two of Gazadan wine, we might wander up past the little chapel of St. Anne and the Duera Tower, then on top of the window to look at the famous Neolithic cart tracks. They just start, then stop again, going nowhere, but they're very, very old. Best-selling writer Eric von Däniken believes that these cart tracks are actually landing grounds for visitors from outer space. Perhaps that's where the Gazetan reputation for innovation comes from. The islanders have been producing high-quality sea salt since Roman times in what are called salt pans. Once upon a time, there was a man who found a way to fill his salt pans more quickly than simply hauling up seawater in buckets. He drilled a hole down through the cliff into a cave fed by the open sea. At high tide, the seawater was pushed up this chimney and quickly filled his salt pans. That summer, the man produced a lot of salt. But in November, with the autumn tides, his chimney became a cannon that shot seawater hundreds of feet into the air, which ruined all the crops in the village fields. The story is that the villagers threw the man down his own hole, swiftly followed by a ton of large stones. But as you can see, today there are still people making sea salt in the traditional way, with the help of a few modern accessories. In this area, there are several sets of pans belonging to different families. These salt pans have been worked by Manuel Cini's family for over 160 years. That's six generations. As it's a completely natural process, the seawater is collected over the hottest four or five months of the year, where there's also less chance of storms, because a whole season's salt is ruined if it's contaminated by a turbulent sea or dusty wind. For the rest of the year, Manuel Cini wears his other hat and works for Maltese Telecom. This is the younger generation, Raymond Cini, Manuel Cini's son. The family lives just up the road. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, we, okay. live at, we live at Zabuc. Zabuc? Yes, yeah, so it's very near from... It's, it's our, the nearest village is near the salt pan. And what are you doing with your life right now? I am studying for, for electrical technician. You're just beginning? Yes, uh, I am at the first year. I have uh, six, uh, five years and more to finish my course. And after that, after you graduate, you want to work as an electrician? Yes, but I would like to continue here as a part-time job. With your father? Yes. You're going to help him? Yes. Or he helped me, I think so. He's getting very old now. So Raymond Cini intends to continue the family tradition into the seventh generation. Alvin Shikluna is another Gazetan who's worn several different hats. He used to be a school teacher who risked everything to form a documentary film company. In 1997, he made four films in Russia. In 1998, he made a series of documentaries in Guatemala. Today, he's filming and interviewing Manuel Cini for us. There used to be many different areas with salt pans on Gozo. Nowadays, most of them are around here. This side of Gozo, the sea is clean, and the rocks are free from sand and seaweed. The rock here is ideal. Production varies according to the type of rock where you dig out your salt pans. Salt crystallizes faster in salt pans where the rock heats up faster in the summer sun. Some of the pans are very old and have been mended with modern cement, which somehow ruins their aesthetic beauty. 
Manuel's family have to rely on each other. There's not enough profit to pay extra hands, and there's always the risk of losing a whole season's salt. It's very demanding work during the summer months, cleaning the pans, filling them with seawater, and just at the right moment to collect the crystals, take them home in sacks, before getting around to packaging the salt and selling it. Ramla Bay is where you find Calypso's cave. This is where Ulysses spent those seven years under her spell. Looking at the glowing red sand dunes, you get some idea why Gazadans come back from all over the world to take their families for a ritual picnic. To get a Maltese falcon's eye view of Ramla and the rest of Gozo, we've been using a novel form of transport, the product of that Gazetan ingenuity, an ultralight motorized hang glider mounted on an inflatable dinghy. Our pilot, Henry Rota, is a man of many parts. For years, he was a successful, if rather conservative, businessman. Then, after an unfavorable medical diagnosis, his whole life changed. No more playing safe. Life was to be lived to the full. He's a bit of an inventor, as you can see. At weekends, he goes across to Malta and gives lessons in hang gliding and paragliding. And just for a change on Friday nights, he has his own program on Radio Calypso. This week, he's been introducing us to parts of Gozo that many Gazetans have never visited. 2% of the total Maltese workforce is involved in agriculture and most of the farming is done on Gozo. Modern tractors side by side with donkeys. And every square mile contains enough history, enough prehistory, folklore, fantasy and fun, enough diversity and devotion to call back thousands of Gazetans from the four corners of the earth. Because Gozo has a character and a soul quite different from Malta. Gozo is where the Maltese go to get away from it all. Life is much more laid back here. Tonight, Henry has invited us to a restaurant where the cabaret is provided by our pilot Henry and his Scottish wife. Just like a blind man, I wandered alone. War isn't the years I claim for my own. Like a blind man, the God gave back his sight. We're having a late night tonight, but we'll all be up at dawn tomorrow, as Henry wants to take us to where the Gazadans go to get away from it all. The famous Blue Lagoon is trapped between the west coast of the island of Comino and the tiny islet of Cominato. Comino is about five minutes by motorboat or ultralight plane from the main harbor at Umjar. Gozo's little sister covers no more than one square mile, and the permanent population is just eight people, including the island's policeman and priest. Comino is a bird sanctuary, and in springtime, there's a profusion of wild spices, herbs, and flowers, including wild orchids. San Nicolau and Santa Maria Bays are both worth a day of anybody's time on or under the surface. The 
There are no cars on Camino, very little noise. But the hotel and holiday complex offer every activity to do with the sea that you could imagine. In it, above it, beside it, or below it. Up here with Henry, we're flying too close to the sun for comfort. Like Icarus, it's time to cool off in those limpid, clear waters. Below the surface of the sea around Gozo is a whole new world. Il Hofre Tel Bedouin, the peasant's hole, surrounded by ancient shells and fossils, leads down into a natural aquarium where the swimmer can stir up an enchanting collection of fishes and stingrays. In season, you can fish for the local delicacy, lampuki, and ask your Gazetan friends to make you a lampuki pie. There are huge groupers in Chernia, one of the obvious reasons why they hold the World Underwater Fishing Championships here. But to take part, you need to be able to swim well and to be able to use the latest equipment. Of course, you can also go fishing with an underwater camera. There's some fine coral, and if you're lucky, you might find an amphor or some other relic from a sunken Phoenician or Roman galley between here and Schlendi Bay. The tunnel from the calm and peaceful inland sea is always full of promise. Today, it's calm and so peaceful. But sometimes the seas around Malta can be very rough. And even the peaceful Blue Lagoon can become thoroughly unwelcoming and uninviting. Perhaps it was another miracle that shipwrecked St. Paul on the islands in 60 AD and converted these islands to Christianity. There are still well over 90% practicing Catholics. If you travel by internal ferry, you only pay for the return journey. So if you decide to stay on Gozo for the rest of your life, you never have to pay. Perhaps you'll buy your own Lutsu and go out fishing every day.
Each year, thousands of ex-Gazatans return to visit the 23,000 who stayed behind. The ties are very strong. But so are the ties to their new homes in the New World and Australasia. So many will pay the ferryman for their return journey. The Maltese, and above all the Gothitans, are born travelers. But there are many of us, old visitors and new, who've been bewitched by Calypso and will be only too happy to stay for the next seven years. <laughs>